with 31 states projecting budget shortfalls in 2013, state boards will continue to see legislatures looking at consolidating boards as a means to reducing their budgets. And one of those states is Georgia. And Wanda Goodson is here to walk us through the consolidation legislation that was filed in her state's assembly last year, and also to discuss possible legislation that will be filed in 2013. Wanda. Good afternoon, everyone. First, let me give you an overview of our Georgia board. It's very much different from Carla's board. We share staff with eight other boards. Our executive, executive director admitted to us that he had maybe two days before our meetings to devote to our board. We have no independent budget. We have to take up money past the hat if we want coffee at our meetings. Uh, we get a stipend to go to the meetings and we get travel. Our board is strictly reactive. We have no budget to be proactive. So all we can do is react to complaints. Um, in the Secretary of State's defense, his appropriations for the professional licensing boards has dropped over 17% since 2007. So he's, you know, desperate to get his budget in shape. His idea was to propose a rewrite of Title 43, which is the Professional Licensing Board uh, law. His idea was to create a Georgia Board of Licensing and Regulations. This would be a seven-member board made it up completely of consumer members. Its duty was to hear appeals made by the Director of Professional Licensing and review for approval rules recommended by the professional 43 professional licensing boards. He was going to convert the 43 licensing boards to policy boards only. Um, let's see. The duty of the policy licensing boards was only to recommend new rules or rule amendments offer expert opinions to the, the director of professional licensing. It was, in Georgia, it was an immediate uproar. The licensees and the state boards couldn't believe that this was happening. Uh, he had two hearings in the state. They really weren't hearings, they were just more information. When people went there and tried to ask questions, they were pretty much blown off. He, uh, some, some of the professional licensing boards were questioning when they would have meetings and he said, it's not my problem, you can meet whenever you want to. But it was such an uproar in the state that he eventually had to withdraw the bill, which was a relief. Of course, now we have another bill that he is uh, proposing to bring up that's even more ludicrous than the one he brought up last year. <laughs> I don't know. But he did tell us that if he didn't have immediate um, support of the new bill, that he wouldn't even introduce it. So that's where we are now. My question to all of you and, and to John, and John wants feedback on this. Even before this bill was introduced, the Georgia Board was uh, looking toward avenues of independence, semi-independence. And we have formed a task force with the um, Georgia State Society of CPAs. And they do have draft legislation to introduce so that we can become a semi-independent board. And my question to you is if any of you know how successful this kind of legislation has been for other states and can give us any pointers in how to go about it. We're, when we approached the Secretary of State when he was running for office about becoming a semi-independent board, oh, he immediately said, no, 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 because I think our board probably funds several other boards that are not as lucrative as we are. So it's going to be an uphill battle. So if you have any suggestions to, you know, for us, for us in Georgia, contact me or John and let us know 
how to go about this. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you. And before we move on to our, our next case study, I just want to mention that in, in addition to Georgia and Oklahoma, there was also board consolidation legislation in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina. And we're already hearing about board consolidation legislation in Alabama, the District of Columbia, and of course, uh, we'll see what happens again in Georgia and Oklahoma and other states. But thank you very much, Wanda, for that update. Our third case brings us to Pam Ivey and, and what appeared to be you know, the good intentions by the Wyoming legislature to streamline the occupational licensing process for military and military spouses ended up having some unintended consequences. And, and Pam is here to give us some background on that particular piece of legislation and to share her story on how the Wyoming Board identified and was able to resolve that issue during last legislative session. So, Pam. Thank you. I appreciate being asked to, um, to speak. Um, my story, I think, is um, probably an illustration of a very um, hard lesson well learned. I've, as John said, I've only been with the board. It'll be two and a half years in December. And this experience was um, really kind of eye-opening and shocking as to how something could come completely out of left field and could have been uh, a big problem in terms of public protection as well as in terms of mobility for the profession in Wyoming. Uh, first of all, let's see here. What I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why the um, why this licensing bill became an issue. Um, then I've done a little bit of research on how many states have voted in favor of licensing legislation for military members and or spouses. Uh, what happened in Wyoming, and then where does Wyoming go from here? And just to um, just to start, I I was doing a little bit more. Um, uh, research and I found a, a report that I did not refer to in the slides but in February of 2012 there was another report issued by a federal agency in response to um, to the report that I refer to in the slides but the paragraph from the report really kind of sums it up and the reason for this push is given the volunteer nature of our military the sacrifices military families make for this country and the importance of retaining these families to maintain the readiness of our military, ensuring that licensing procedures do not needlessly hinder military spouses is critically important. And so what the, um, what the Obama administration has recognized is that it's been difficult to attract and retain uh, talent in the military, and they're trying to make an effort to, um, to stem uh, those issues. Um, however, as John said, some of the uh, consequences are unintended. The, um, a picture of the front page of the report that I provide to you is called Strengthening Our Military Families. And um, the report was issued in 2011, January 2011, under presidential seal. And um, there are four different points that are uh, touched on in the report. Um, first one is enhancing well-being and psychological health of the military family. Second, ensuring excellence in military children's education and their development. Third, develop career and educational opportunities for military spouses, and one of those is to reduce barriers to employment and services due to differing state policies and standards. And then the fourth is increased child care availability and quality for, uh, for the armed forces. And I don't think any of those things are things that people could argue with as being as being good and, and well intended. Uh, the report itself was co-authored by uh, Mrs. Obama and Dr. Jill Biden. Again, it was endorsed by the president. And I've been in corporate life long enough to know that a signed statement of support is a department's commitment to putting all its resources and focus towards making sure something happens. And the Department of Defense, um, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates did sign this. And that's kind of how this, um, this started for us in Wyoming. Back in February, uh, 
right before the President's Day weekend, and that, that's significant because I needed, need to tell you that every, uh, every state and the federal government, most, um, most private businesses celebrate the three-day weekend that we call President's Day weekend, but the Wyoming legislature does not. And so, right before the President's Day weekend, this bill uh, became public, and it was a bill that uh, incorporated both licensing of military members as well as um, basically re reciprocity for military spouses. And the concern is that the way the bill was written, and we'll talk about it in a, a little bit later, but the way the bill is written, it would have been a threat to public protection and it would have been a threat to substantial equivalence for Wyoming. And um, it was difficult uh, to try and, I, I was a wreck because I was thinking that it would be really difficult for any politician or any lawmaker to, um, to try and withdraw support for something that may, may get legs before everybody returned to work on Tuesday. I've got to say, um, I really appreciate Ken Bishop and Dan Dustin, and if John had been on staff, I'm sure he would have been very helpful too, and I'm looking forward to working with him in the future. Um, they were very helpful. Um, people at AICPA were helpful to try and put together some resources. Um, our um, board members and society members were able to speak to uh, the committee, uh, a committee before it, the bill was to be introduced. Our um, chairman, uh, Pat McGuire, who's in the audience, um, spoke on behalf of public protection and, and how this would have been um, just not a good thing. The um, initiative has a catchy phrase called joining forces. Um, taking action to serve America's military families. I'm a military brat, I've got two kids in the military and I have no problem with military. But um, this, this bill and the way it was introduced was a, was a problem. Um, you have three different slides that show a list of 23 different states that have approved or adopted laws to make it easier. The source for this is www.armytimes.com. So if your state's listed and it's not correct or your state is not listed and it should be, that's the source. Um, it's kind of sketchy information, but uh, it was the best I could do. What I want to say though is no state wants to be singled out and not included on the list, which leads us to the question, in red, um, is it anti-military to oppose legislation intended to assist military members and spouses in assimilating into the civilian community? And it kind of comes down to a question like that. And actually, you have to, you have to really um, explain your, yourself so that people understand it's not anti-military to question this, but it has to be done in the right way. Um, Wyoming is ranked among the top 20 states that report the largest uh, population of military spouses per thousand, civilian spouses. And I, um, I had the pleasure earlier in my career to work for the Cheyenne Chamber of Commerce. And I staffed the Military Affairs Committee for seven years. And I heard numerous times from military members that Cheyenne was a preferred place to be stationed and to be retired. So um, clearly, Wyoming is well thought of in the military community. So the draft becomes public right before the three-day President's Day weekend. And um, again, I was concerned that it would get legs before we could actually oppose it. And the next um, couple of slides just show you that for military spouses, and both of these were, were put together even though the original report in January of 2011 was about military spouses, the Department of Defense liaison said, well, we decided that because uh, the unemployment rate for military members is so high, we'd just throw them into the bill too. And so um, this Department of Defense liaison kind of on her own um, will with the, with the help of a state senator just sort of lumped this all together. But the military member would have been, we would have requi been required to issue a certificate to a military member based solely on his or her experience in the military. And this is not just a CPA uh, situation or issue. This 
This is related to all of the occupations and profession in, professions in Wyoming. And the only two carve-outs are the attorneys and the physicians and surgeons. But if, you're, if you were a dentist, supposedly in the military, you could become a dentist in civilian life or um, work in accounting and finance, you could become a CPA. So it was, um, it was really uh, kind of a wild uh, sort of a bill. Fortunately, however, um, the, uh, the, the committee listened. The committee chairman did make a comment to the uh, state senator that maybe his bill needed a little bit more work. And um, so I probably have a state senator who's not really happy with me, but, it, you know, it's, that's the way it is. Um, so the bill died for lack of introduction on general file. So... Um, the Wyoming Board of CPAs seems to be the board that is that has the uh, greatest interest in this. And over this past year, um, Governor Mead has tasked the Adjutant General of the State of Wyoming for the Wyoming Military Department, who happens to hold an inactive certificate. Fortunately, he understands us and knows that we're not out to uh, to do anything to harm the military. He was tasked with the. Um, uh, with the goal of getting the legislation passed this session. So throughout the this past year, um, and most recently in September, we attended another committee meeting, and the language still looks good. It looks like we'll be able to do what, what um, Wyoming needs to do to look like a military-friendly state without it being a harm to public protection, either for CPAs or for any other... Uh, profession. Um, I do expect that it will be introduced in January. I do expect that it will be passed. And there's already been talk at the committee level that even before the bill is enacted, the uh, legislation, even before being signed by the governor, will require that boards begin the rulemaking process to incorporate it into their, into their rules. So uh, again, uh, thanks to Ken Bishop. I forgot to mention Noel Allen. He was awesome, um, very, very helpful, and Dan Dustin. So I just really encourage you, if you ever have anything like this going on, that you get in touch with NASBA. It's a tremendous resource. I'd always heard that, but I hadn't had a chance to really tap into him. So thank you very much. And that, that's a great job by Pam and the Wyoming Board to, first of all, to identify that there was a flaw in a, a legislation that had a good intention. So great job by Wyoming for identifying that. Our final speaker is Bucky Glover, Chair of the State Board Relevance and Effectiveness Committee, who will give us an update on what's being discussed in his committee to help your board stay strong. Bucky. Uh, thank you. you know, Mark, I appreciate you having the... Um, annual meeting down in Orlando. I've seen magical things that I've never seen anywhere else. It even happened the day at lunch. There was a purple cauliflower and green chicken, which was new to me, but, but uh, <laughs> it was quite interesting. In 2010, under Dr. Um, Carlos Johnson's uh, leadership, the State Board Relevance and Effectiveness Committee produced a white paper that suggested that the that boards that were autonomous and semi-independent would be more relevant and more effective. And it, it defines some of the uh, attributes of those boards. What has happened, though, has been very difficult, as you can hear from all the, the panelists, it's been very difficult to move boards toward autonomy and toward semi-independence. And its current economic environment and legislative environment probably doesn't let us go that far. So, Keeping that in mind, the committee worked and, and worked diligently and helped define that, you know, what we really want to do is make boards more relevant and more effective and focus on the public protection mission. And the more we talked about it, we thought, you know, how else to convince legislatures or, or other people in government that we're being effective and relevant if we don't have metrics to identify what is what relevance and effectiveness looks like. The white paper that was produced helped define the, the components and the elements of, of good um, board activities, 
but what it didn't do was define what does effectiveness look like. So we've worked kind of diligently over the last year and, and with the help of the committee and with the particular help of, of some executive directors, Rick Sweeney, Mike Barham, and Mike Henderson, pulled together a benchmark metric tool. And what that benchmark metric tool has, is, is outlined in is six components or elements of effectiveness. Initial qualifications and licensing, continued competency, CPE if you will, compliance with uh, rules and regulations, enforcement activities by the board, board operations, how, how many people are we doing, how many people are we serving, what's our cost of, of, um, of serving, and rulemaking, getting rules uh, into, that we need into um, effect, and finally, collaboration with stakeholders. And stakeholders were not only the, the public, but also the legislatures. And when we produced this, this, this uh, benchmarking tool, can't get it to advance, Ryan, there you go. We produced a, a census, if you will, it's an annual census that outlines metrics in each one of these six categories. And I want to caution that the, the, the tool is not to compare boards to boards. That's not what it's, it's there for. And it's not even going to be published such that you can see every board, but you can see your board. And over a period of time, you can begin to identify trends and opportunities where you can improve. This morning at our regional breakout, uh, the state of Maryland, if I can be so bold to, to, to use them as an example, has been measuring their operations for about six years. They were mandated by their government to do such. And what was interesting was they could tell when budgets were cut or people were removed how their efficiencies and how their effectiveness and how relevant they were to their constituents, how that changed. And what it, what it did was it encouraged them to understand the value of people and the value of service. What we hope is, is that when we develop these trends and develop these areas to improve and we make improvement, now we can go to the legislative with empirical data and say, look, as a consolidated board or with these attributes that that are not toward autonomous or independent boards, we cannot be as effective. We don't have the investigation budget. We don't have the, the budgets to operate our, our um, licensing application process. Whatever it may be, we can show that we can get more effective and more relevant by, by having different attributes of, of operations. So what we want to do is, and we're going to roll this out to the executive directors, I believe at the executive directors, upcoming executive directors conference in, in March, is to provide an annual benchmark data collection to assist with boards in seeking the um, incremental increases, if you will, slowly chipping away at the ice to become more relevant and more effective. We won't, would like for all boards to participate. And please understand that it's a tool to assist in getting better. It's not to evaluate. It's your board. Your board will be using this to measure itself year by year by year and your progression toward being more relevant and more effective. I'd also like to, to shout out a, a, a thanks to Ed Bonicott, who put together this, this NASBA staff, who put together this um, census, if you will, and this measuring tool. I hope that all of you will consider using it in trying to measure how effective you are, how well you operate, so you can demonstrate to the legislature how, you can, how well a job you are doing and how you can be better if they give you more opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Bucky. Um, uh, before we can conclude and take your questions, um, I'd like to leave you with a, a few thoughts as we, um, as a profession, try to enhance certainly the effectiveness of boards of accountancy. And, and it's something that's very simple. It's, it's called educating candidates running for office. Um, and as we know, a week from today, the citizens of the United States will be electing a president. There are also 11 states, there's two territories who will be electing their governors. There are 33 of the 100 U.S. Senate seats that are up for being contested in the United States Senate. All 435 of the newly drawn congressional seats are up for election and an astonishing 6,015 of the country's 7,383 state legislative seats have candidates at the ballot box next week. 
And I think it's just fair to say that, you know, the outcome of next week's elections will certainly affect the issues that our panelists discuss today and, and many other issues and how they're handled in legislatures over the next several years. And I think it's important to just to point out how we mobilize together as a profession to educate candidates who eventually become legislators about the profession and how it's regulated will certainly help us better to serve and protect the public in the years to come. Um, I want to thank our panelists uh, for their enlightening discussion and discussing the legislation that was passed in 2012. I also look forward to working with each of you in my new role as NASBA's Director of Legislative and Government Affairs. And at this time, we would certainly like to take any questions that you have. Um, if you approach the, the mic, that would be great. If you have any questions. <laughs>